I was going to take off my vest uh, for, for this. Uh, apparently, it can make some noise against the microphone. But when I see all the color up here on stage, I decided that we were going. To, I was going to stick with the theme. And uh, you know, the theme of, of this panel and uh, where it fits in the program is is pretty interesting this year compared to last year because it's fair to say in a way it was implied by Alessia that, uh, that uh, last year the NFT was the solution to everything. This year, I don't know, yesterday at the music panel, once again, blockchain is being described as a solution in service of a problem. So I think where we find ourselves this year is in fact to uh, a, at a wither blockchain moment that I think is not a real one in the sense that if you separate Web3 as a currency from Web3 as a technology. As a technology, blockchain continues when you re look back over the <laughs> seven years of Ethereum on a straight path upwards towards integration into the global digital economy. Uh, cryptocurrencies fluctuate. And I think the two in your minds, as you listen to these experts in the space, keep in mind to separate your thoughts that come from the recent headlines around uh, that have taken these fluctuations and brought them really to the foreground of the conversation about cryptocurrencies, separate it from really where we work, which is more in terms of the integration of a new approach to, to digital business of, of, a, of a distributed and decentralized nature, which in fact is year to year, including over the last year, enjoyed a tremendous amount of success in being further integrated into the global economy. And with that, let me turn this over to uh, Rene and, and Marjorie. And, um, and I think it's best to start by saying, that the title of the panel implies, in a way, the answer to the question. Because the title of the panel has to do with the impact of Web3. If Web3 is having an impact, then clearly it is not a solution in search of a problem, it is solving problems. So please, let's, uh, let me ask each of you in order, and start with you, Marjorie. Um, how do you see Web3 uh, as having a, a public goods impact you are in the Web3 cultural impact space, I'd say it's fair to say, but how do you see it in your day-to-day -day life as Luxo having a, a public goods impact? Yeah, that, that's an amazing question and good morning everybody. Thank you for being awake here this morning with us. Um, you know, I think when, when, when the whole kind of like blockchain movement started, there was this belief that it's gonna solve all of the problems. Like all of a sudden we have this thing that is gonna solve everything, but the question was how are we gonna start? And I think we start facing a lot of issues because the potential of Web3 is there, but for that to actually realize, a lot of pieces need to be built. A lot of things need to happen. So I think there is a discrepancy between what you were saying, that is the public perception of a, compo a key component in decentralized systems, which is the, the tokenization of assets and the volatility attached to it, um, kind of like migrates towards the perception of the technology that, as you said, is kind of like independent of the, of the volatility of, in the markets. So I think um, one of the things that, in my opinion, is key is understanding that we need we are in a long path and we are still very early in that road and then we just need to build products and I think the conversation is a lot around the value creation and the speculation and the opportunities of financial game in a short term but I think the the point we're at is that we really need to build really good products and I think that is what is missing in our space and in terms of impact and the impact that it will have is the stuff that we always talk about right it's the fact that as an user you can be controlling of your data as a creator you can kind of like issue your assets by yourself and you are empowered by the fact that you are the person controlling your IP you become the issuer of your IP and then by nature you can go to market globally from the beginning so I think there's a a lot of different um, kind of like web reasons why Web3 has a massive impact. I am a national of Venezuela. I grew up in Caracas, and you know, we I part of my life experience at the beginning was witnessing kind of like how corrupt institutions can destroy 
pretty much anything on your daily life, right? I remember being seven years old and I was going with my mom to the bank and the bank was intervened. So the bank didn't exist, was intervened the night before and then the money was gone and everything was gone. So I think when you, ex when you live in a society in which institutions work really well, you don't really stop to think what will happen if they are not working well. So I think we have for the first time a technology that presents a solution to a lot of issues that we're facing as a society as part of just being in a progression in which we went from trusting God or gods to trusting you know, the church, to trusting the state, and now we can progress into trusting something else. And in this case, it's technology, and we hope that that trust comes from a source that is potentially less corruptible and less emotional and things like that. So I think that the question is very broad. I have like two views on it that impact the decisions that I do in my professional life. That is one, having witnessed my whole life how institutions can be so incredibly corrupted, and also how, as a creator or a creator of, of culture, you have an amazing opportunity to enter the markets in a completely new way. So for you, Web3's impact is to empower the creator community. I think it, one of them is the impact of the creator community, of, of the creator economy, and I think it's like for the first time having an economy that is actually run by creators and by the product of, of those creative goods, basically. And for you, Rene, I think somewhat different. I, I, I know that you are also involved, uh, Cello is involved also with the uh, creator economy in different ways. You and I were having a conversation about gaming and other things yesterday, the arts, music perhaps. But in the main, I think Cello is more involved with more the way we more traditionally think about impact in public goods, having an ESG, even though uh, Al Albert doesn't believe in ESG. I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that quote's quite fair even to Albert. I wish he'd had more time to explain it because I don't think that's actually his view. I think he's talking about so, so many of the numbers that come out around ESG are actually misleading. I, I totally agree with Albert about that. But I think you work more specifically in and around ESG issues using Web3. Yeah, and maybe even taking a step back, I mean, in the previous panel, I mean, it's music, music to my ears, you know, I think we as a society, the, the biggest problems we face are ultimately mass coordination problems, right? Whether it's the climate crisis, extreme poverty, and Web3, you can think of Web3 as a coordination tool, a mass coordination tool. Um, and that's, that's really powerful, and, you know, I think that has given a lot of folks, me included, hope that Web3 can be part of a solution. And of course, there's, there's other elements that can be part of a solution, whether you know, that's coming through regulation, politics, and, and just civic engagement. But as a technology, this is a really powerful uh, tool set that suddenly become available. And I can, I can go into some examples, but please, at Cello, uh, one, one thing that we've uh, been very excited about is uh, some of the concepts around regenerative economics. Uh, there's a term now, regenerative finance, which has really taken off over the last year. And it's really, uh, in many ways, the complete opposite of our current economic or even financial paradigm where, you know, all the focus is on, on sort of just gross, 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 right, at, at the expense of um, the, the resources, the, the environment. Uh, versus with uh, you know regenerative finance, um, you you are actually uh, you're rewarding these these or you, you're creating positive externalities, whether they are for the planet, um, whether they are for communities or even the individual, and and to me that's that's really powerful that we have the chance now that money is a technology you know money as sort of the way we know it hasn't really changed in the last 500 600 years. But suddenly with Web3, um, it's, it's technology, it's software, it can have really rich features, things that may have been tried here and there experimentally. You know, I think um, there's some, some fun reading out there, for example, The Miracle, the, the, the miracle of Virgil, I recommend uh, looking that up. Um, and so you, you, you find these, or even community currencies in different parts of the world, you, you find these nuggets of like, wow, uh, what if all of our money could, could be like that, but to date, the technology has not been there uh, to actually rule that out at a, at a bigger scale. And I think this is where 
Web3 can really come in. And, and so I would encourage everyone here who's new to this um, to, to approach it through that lens versus, you know, certainly, um, and this was in, in sort of the lead into the session, yeah, you know, um, there's bad actors everywhere and, and certainly our industry has had their fair share, but um, I think that is uh, really, um, you know, only a, a tiny part of, of sort of the bigger story that, that is happening here. And, and I grew up in the East, um, you know, and, and been, been through that, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, I've seen the, you know, early internet happening. And I, I feel this moment right now is um, potentially more impactful uh, than, than those two. And that, that really, um, you know, means, it should mean a lot. DLD is the best curated conference in the world, and hats off, really, uh, chapeaus, as they say, to Yossi and Steffi for, uh, for the way they curate these sessions. People out there are wondering, why are these guys up here? So let's take a minute and drill down on your companies that got you up here. Yes. Luxo, yes. 2022, 2023. Yes. Talk about your accomplishments in 22 as you see them. Uh, both uh, the good news and the, maybe some of the less good news. Let's yes. be straight up with our friends in the audience. Yes. Now that we all had dinner together last night, <laughs> we're, all, we're all one big family here. Be straight up. 2022, how did it go for you? And 2023, yeah. talk about your roadmap. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a great question. So we started Luxo. We came up with the idea and started working on it in 2017. And we, we identified this opportunity of building a technology stack that will kind of like pack blockchain technology and put it out there for creators, brands, artists, etc., to build their own applications in the way you build applications in the web. Web3 is slightly more complex, so we need to build a lot of standards and interfaces in between, basically, and that's what Luxo is focusing on. We published an awesome white paper that has aged incredibly well called Blueprint for a New Creative Economy. So it's a very light, easy 160 pages, if you guys feel like having some midnight readings. Um, and, you know, for us, we've been part of the, of the Web3 and the blockchain space if you may call it that way, since 2012. So we went through this progression at the beginning. People will tell me like, but Marjorie, you are so smart. Why are you into this weird stuff? And then people will treat me like if I was virtually a drug dealer at certain points. Like, why are you inter interested into this stuff that is so devious? And I think we have come a long way. And me and my co-founder, Fabian, at Luxo, we really... We are the two people, I guess, that look at the, at the markets the least, right? And we went at the beginning of our journey of, obviously, we were heavily invested and attempted to mine bitcoins very unsuccessfully and did the whole shabang. But then we have moved towards, like, listen, we cannot be victims of the status of the market. So basically, the way we manage our treasury is like you will manage the treasury of any other company um, that is not a Web3 one. And we try to ignore the current state of the market. So Luxo, it's really deep in the trenches. We really love the bear market because it's the time where we can build in peace and people are not question they're questioning everything. But there's not so much hype around like why you haven't launched yet and why you haven't raised yet again $500 million. Like you should do it now because the market is doing so well. So we are always focusing on building our products and our technology. And then Quite frankly, the last years, especially since COVID, has been our best years, unfortunately. I mean, unfortunately for, for, for the people who that was not the case for them, but for us has been a really, a really good time because a lot of the proposals that we were presenting, it became very clear that that was the direction in terms of like the dematerialization of goods and assets and how consumption will transition into primarily digital consumption and how people will spend most of their, li their lives and the, the free time and the professional time in some sort of virtual or digital environment. So we have like those propositions were validated, right? Which before people thought we were living in this future that is not yet here. Uh, the process, like that, that process that we collectively went through during COVID, it demonstrated that it's actually the world we are moving rapidly towards. So it, was, it has been a really good time for us now. This year is very important because we are about to launch the first 1.0 version of all of our things. So I invite you to like stay tuned to all of the stuff that we will be releasing. But I think, you know, for us, we try to ignore the fact that our market is so volatile and then focus on our actual mission. And we have a very clear mission and a very clear 
kind of like proposition, and we are very maximalist about our beliefs, and then we just move forward with them. And if people are doubting them because the price of Bitcoin really makes them very emotional, then so be it. That's none of my business, you know? Sure. And I think the problem in our space is that when the price is going up, people think the price is going to go up to perpetuity, and then we are all going to become trillionaires anytime soon. And then when the market crashes and things like Terra and, and FTX happen, people think this is the absolute end. So it's neither or, right? I think technologies don't disappear when we know there is an innovation and a breakthrough like blockchain technology is going to happen. It's inevitable. So for us, it's just about building those key pieces and carry on with our mission. Rene. Cello, 22, 23. Look, I, I agree. I mean, um, activity is, is at an all-time high, all high right now. And so, you know, it's really, I think, what you said in the beginning as well. You know, it's, it's important to distinguish sort of crypto prices versus what's actually but being built and the products. know what Cello is. So I'll, I'll give, you are I'll, start, I'll, start, I'll start with the <laughs> overview. Um, so you can think of uh, Cello as, you know, really almost like a, like a side chain um, to, to Ethereum uh, focused on, on mobile. You know, a lot of the, the things I said about regenerative finance, uh, when we think about how do we achieve that, that real-world impact, it comes down to people in this room, but also people everywhere in the world. You know, we have 6.4 billion people on, on mobile phones, and, and they're not included in the digital economy. And so the way to do that is to give them easy tools to participate. Um, and I think where the Internet has done a great job in, you know, making information accessible uh, to the world, uh, that's, that's yet to come for, for value, for economic um, opportunity. And so Celo, you know, as a, as a, as a blockchain platform, um, provides, provides that, provides the tools, and, um, you know, is, is really sort of the base infrastructure layer, um, has, has many of the features that people love about Ethereum, but then also has some extra features that make that sort of last mile problem or solve that last mile problem. Um, it's been a proof of uh, stake chain from, uh, from launch, so you know, carbon negative uh, validators include many um, you know, projects building on the platform around the world. Uh, it's very, probably the most global um, community out there, um, but also includes big companies like Deutsche Telekom here in Germany um, that, um, that, are, that are part of the community securing the chain and, um, and utilizing it. And so we're, if, if we look at where we are right now, we've processed about a quarter billion transactions on the platform. Um, there's really thousands of projects that are, um, many of them really very aligned from a mission perspective. Uh, Albert was up here um, right before, um, I don't know if he's still here. He invested in a project called Impact Market that's built on Celo that is to my knowledge, the biggest uh, global uh, universal basic income, um, but it's, it's set up in a way that it's, 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 it's decentralized, it's programmatic, so anyone here could uh, go in and directly give money to a community and the payouts are made directly to a mobile phone and uh, that person in local context can then cash out or use it for payments in their community. And um, this, the, the speed at which some of these solutions have um, yeah, gotten a foothold um, is, is really amazing and, and, and speaks to the power of building in the open, building, you know, in a way, public goods infrastructure that others can, can tie into. And so if I go back to five, six years ago when we started working on Celo, um, you know, a lot of the ideas and UBI was, was one of them that got us excited to start this are now actually being built by others on, on the platform. And so my role at the Celo Foundation is really more, uh, it's more, it's more like a supporting role. So we provide a lot of grants uh, for additional public goods infrastructure. We make some investments, um, but, but yeah, I go into this year and some of the big trends I see, particularly around regenerative finance, are natural assets coming on chain. So last year there was uh, a big push towards tokenizing carbon credits to make them programmatically usable on chain. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there, there's, a, there's some really amazing teams projects out there. For example, there's one started out of uh, ETH Zurich right now that's uh, tokenizing biodiversity to make that uh, be a building block in this new financial system. Really interesting. You could think about all kinds of new use cases. Um, you could think about those natural assets being collateral for new currencies, um, such as the case um, um, in Curaçao right now where Colectivo, another uh, project on the platform has launched a community currency that's literally backed by food forest and, and the future coral reefs and is used to create 
um, you know, wealth for the community. And, um, and, you know, I was there for the launch and it's amazing to see really regular pe people, merchants use, uh, use the currency, use the wallets. And to me, that's really a sign for how far we've come as an industry in the last five years of making this more usable for, for regular people, for people who don't actually care that it's, you know, <laughs> Web3 or blockchain under the hood, uh, but they just want to have something that gets the job done. And, you know, to your earlier point sure. about, we're not like, you know, a solution looking for a problem, but, um, you know, we're seeing really real world problems being solved with this technology. And um, I think we're about to enter a phase where these solutions um, will, will get to a scale where, um, you know, in a way, those headlines will maybe also kind of, uh, you know, uh, take over sort of some of the public narrative that's, that's still dominated by, um, you know, folks like Sam Bankman-Fried. Yeah, this is, this is a space where it seems to me blockchain and Web3 are thriving, uh, which is uh, operating in this space in, in almost the barter economies of the, these uh, sort of subsistence economies where you're working between people who have food and people who need food and somehow need a currency to make that logical or people who have solar on their roof and have extra power and people who need power. It, it, blockchain becomes... Uh, uh, the cur not all currency uses are Sam Bankman freed. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, I, I think it, as all of us in, our, in an ideal world think of this sort of barter world where everybody's taking care of everybody else, blockchain has a, the potential to become the way we keep track of that. Now, let's stick with the numbers in these last couple of minutes that we have. You use two numbers. One is uh, a quarter of a billion transactions last year, and the other is 6.4 billion people with mobile phones. And I'm thinking about the two of you who are in some, even though you both live in the same, your neighbors, basically. Mm -hmm. um, you work in very different parts of the business, fashion and uh, regenerative uh, uh, economics. However, what unites you both is you both need blockchain to work in the last mile. Right? You are mobile phone based. Everybody's got a mobile phone. You make blockchain easy for consumers to access. You, you're in the fashion business. You need a, a very big audience to buy your fashion. And yet, blockchain, when, the way we think about it, is kind of rather a, a small audience. The number of people who actually know that they are on a blockchain or have a wallet is only is fewer people than many singers have fans on YouTube. I mean, it's a fairly, in Web2 terms, of very small numbers. How do the two of you view this, uh, this uh, the need for Web3 to grow this last mile? I see Marcus from uh, Deutsche Telekom sitting over there who's got 250 million subscribers. That's, that's a last mile, okay. that's scale. How do the two of you see taking your companies to scale over the next, uh, over 2023 and 2024? Yeah, no, that's an amazing question. And I think it goes back to the fact that, you know, so far almost all of the interfaces that we have to, to communicate with the blockchain, let's say, they are not really that great. And they're very difficult to use and the user journey is complicated and you, you have to do a lot of things before you can even get started. So I think it goes down to building better, more usable products. They are really user centric and truly, truly friendly. I think the Web3 user journey is highly problematic and nobody who is like a regular user who wants to go to an e-commerce platform and buy a pair of digital sneakers will normally go through such a hassle, right? It's not intuitive, it's not the way. And the reason why it makes so much news is because yes, even though it's very few people, you could say maybe there's a million active users on chain at this point in time, which in, as you said, in web two terms, like nobody will care, right? Um, or it will be a very, a very promising young startup. And in our case, it's a, hu it's a huge community worth billions of dollars is because we have that incredible value creation and we most people can identify it and subscribe to the belief that definitely the technology is going to achieve all of these amazing things but it goes down to building better products and better, better interfaces and you know for us a lot so since the beginning you know our ethos and our motto is around the creator economy because it's the the industry and the, and the space and me i'm a co-founder we both met when we were both in design school in weimar you know it's the stuff that we're passionate about but i think it just goes down to like people need to be excited 
about using these applications. People need to be excited about the consequences of using these applications. And then the fact that it's Web3, that it's blockchain, that it's proof of stake, that all of that shabang, nobody will care. Like, most of us don't understand half of the things that we utilize on a daily basis. We are in absolute ignorance about most of the infrastructure around us, and we still were able to act in this world and engage, right? And right now, unfortunately, in blockchains, like, people really need to dig deep and become some sort of like, pseudo-experts before they can get started. And I'm going to take uh, the privilege of the chair to answer the question on Renee's behalf. Yeah because uh, I see Steffi out of the corner of my eye, and it's a little like at the Oscars when the uh, orchestra starts it's playing, play. they want you to wrap it up. So, 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 so <laughs> but on your behalf, let me say this. Sitting where I sit at Consensus, and we are a company very much baked into the, from the founder of Ethereum, baked into the infrastructure of Web3, we love Celo. We love Celo, as you should, because if you care at all to keep track of this industry, the brilliance of being built in relation to the 6.4 billion mobile economy that's out there is perhaps uh, one of our best and maybe our best opportunity, I think, to conquer the last mile and find genuine scale uh, in our space. And with that, I say thank you all for your patience. Thank you.